This is Houston, Texas. Now, Houston is well known in the urban planning spaces for having some of the worst city planning known to man. But I received a comment recently that has made me believe maybe it's the opposite. Maybe Houston is superior to my home of London. We'll find out. Hi everyone, my name is Evan Edinger, and a couple weeks ago I uploaded a video talking about why London wants to demolish a brand new 90 million pound skyscraper. And what it boiled down to was some planning permissions issues, regulations, a developer seeing what they could get away with, and a council standing firm against it all. I'll link to the video above. I received a lot of insightful comments on this video, but one in particular stood out to me. One from a Houstonian named Benjamin Bunch of Numbers. Now, to be to be fair, I did invoke this. I mentioned Houston by name in the video. And that's something you just shouldn't do. You say Houston and then the Houston people come running to defend their ugly baby. Excuse me? Are you talking about Houston? Actually? Yeah, Houston ton of problems here. Now, for those of you that didn't watch my video, excuse me, that's all right, added context, a lot of the reasons for the future demolition are because the developer went against the planning permissions. They were supposed to have a lot of disabled access and that was basically just completely removed. And also they were supposed to have an underground parking lot, whereas they instead decided to just put it above ground. And I made a quick comment saying that a lot of London boroughs have these measures in place to make sure that it's not so car centric in these new developments. So it doesn't become Houston, Texas. My fault, shouldn't have made fun of Houston because here we go, comment from uh, Benjamin Bunch numbers, We've got, I found it odd, the cultural difference here. Thanks, it's, it's what my whole channel's about, cultural differences. As a Houstonian, I'm appalled that the city dictates these requirements to absurd degrees. I mean, I wouldn't say requiring disabled access to be an absurd degree, but then again, We'll talk about it later. I've seen some photos of Houston. Uh, if the people want it, and they clearly do, since uh, the flats are all sold, they're not all sold, but we'll go on. Then what gives these bureaucrats the right to demand luxuries like green roofs and underground parking? <laughs> luxuries. Uh, it's no wonder there is a housing shortage if you have Soviet level imperial control of the design. Why shouldn't the market be able to decide what amenities a building includes? If this was a safety issue, I might agree, but I find this impingement flat out offensive. All right, there's a lot to unpack here. First off, uh, I did get this comment and my first thought was immediately reply with, is, is a man, man not entitled, entitled to the, the sweat, sweat of his brow? brow? It just felt like this comment was the embodiment of Andrew Ryan from Bioshock, like Atlas Shrugged and libertarianism just compressed into a nice big ball. That was this lovely comment. So let's break this down. First off, they say, what gives the bureaucrats the right to demand luxuries like green roofs and underground parking? I don't know about you, but I don't think most people are going out looking for a place to live for them and their loved ones and going, hmm, what about this place, honey? Uh, I don't think so. That place doesn't have a green roof. And you know me, I, I require a green roof. That's not really a luxury for the people living there. Most green roof places that I've lived in, you don't even get access to the roof. It's more for society in general. You know, the area. We're out here destroying nature to develop cities. And the least we can do is put a little bit of green back on the roof. And there are a lot of benefits that you might not realize to actually having green roofs. I mean, according to BBC here, green roofs are good at cooling the roof surfaces, better at water retention from rainfall, which would be good to help prevent some flooding. They also attract varied animal species, increasing the biodiversity, having a nice place for our bees and our insects. Just throw some green and some flowers on the roof. Is it really that big a deal? And of course, it creates a more pleasant atmosphere. Soviet level control. Why would you want to enjoy your atmosphere? That's a luxury. But on the comment about underground parking being a luxury, obviously when a building wants to have underground parking, that increases the cost of the building a lot, but the alternative doesn't really work in most of London. I don't know if you know this, but London is quite a historic city. And also space is, is quite a premium compared to Houston in which the city just keeps sprawling out further and further. And you can afford to just pave another parking lot because the whole city is basically one big parking lot. But in London, not so much. Now, sure, this is in Woolwich in Southeast London. So there is a bit more space and they were able to build a parking lot around the building. So hypothetically, as you said, what, why should the developer have to do underground parking? Well, I think it comes down to you saying that it's a luxury to have underground parking. I'd like to counter with saying, only a car is a luxury in London. I moved to the UK about 12 years ago now, and I used to drive every day of my life in New Jersey. After I moved here, I have not once in my 12 years ever owned a car and I've gotten by just fine. And most Londoners feel the same, hence why we all use our public transit. We love our London underground, we love our overground, even if they do have a weird new name, and we also love our DLR and the rail and the buses. We have good public transit. So why is it that the average Londoner who has no need for a car would have to pay a visual tax by looking at this ugly parking lot? 
put it underground. I don't want to see that shit. You know what would be nicer? Get some trees. Because we actually enjoy walking in our cities and we wouldn't enjoy it if it looked like Houston, Texas, which is just a big paved wasteland. Back home in Jersey, I had no opportunity to use any public transit because it pretty much didn't exist. I once lived in suburbia and then I moved all the way to East Jabip and neither of these two places allowed me to use any public transit. The only thing that I could do, and this was great, New Jersey is quite good for this, they do have a Patco train, but I'd have to drive about 35 minutes to get to the station and then drop off my car there to eventually get, you know, broken into so I could take the Patco train in to Philadelphia and then get the Amtrak up to New York if I wanted to go to a better city. So, and I know that it's hard to process like what it must be like to use actually good public transit if you're from a place in which that's just non-existent. I remember at one point when I flew to LA from London and I was telling my friend, I'm gonna get this big blue bus to take me from the airport to Santa Monica and it was only gonna cost me a dollar. And she was like, Evan, do not get that. And I was like, why? She was like, Evan, there are like homeless people and junkies and drug addicts on those buses. And I was like, is this just one of those things that posh LA people say because they're like scared of taking public transit? Turns out guys, I did get on that big blue bus and I'm sorry to say, I'm addicted to all the drugs now and I'm also homeless. It, it just, it caught, it caught on to me. No, it was just a bus with people. It's just, just because there's people of lower classes, I guess, also using the services, people in the US get really scared of it. Whereas in the UK and it's like most all Western countries that have functioning public transit, which is most of them, people from all walks of life use it. It's not just the, the lower class or the upper class. You'll see politicians on the trains. I mean, the other day I ran into Jeremy Corbyn. I didn't, I just thought that'd be an interesting story. Now, obviously not everybody has the privilege of being the average Londoner who has no use for a car. My friend, Ellie Spaghetti, she lives near Woolwich and away, Southeast London, and she needs a car to get to her job because her job involves carrying all of her expensive filming kit to different film sets around London. And so she couldn't necessarily do that on public transit. There's a lot of heavy equipment, so she needs a car. But luckily for us, for normal people that don't have a car, she has to pay for it. She has to pay the MOT. She has to pay her insurance and registration. And every time she enters London, she has to pay a surcharge unless her car is ULEZ compliant, meaning that it's ultra low emissions. That's a positive. The thing is, I don't think you guys have heard this, but uh, London isn't necessarily the cleanest city in terms of its air quality. We've got some pollution. I've heard tales of some Northerners that have come back from a trip to London to find their boogers are black. Now, I've never experienced this, and I find the air quality not that bad, but hey, that, that could be my bias. I'm like, what do you mean the air doesn't taste good? That being said, I think it is the duty for these city planners, you know, the people that are actually in charge of seeing the bigger picture, of making sure that we're not making the city worse for everyone. We're not making the air quality worse for everyone. We're trying to discourage anyone that wants to use a car when it's not necessary, because outside of a fringe use case, a lot of people, especially working in London and all the office buildings, they do not need a car. I've worked so many different jobs in London, from retail to like six or seven different office jobs, and I, like I said, I've never once owned a car and I've never once needed one. I've never gone, oh, if only I had a car. Mate, never once. Literally never once. If I wanted to do like a road trip out of London, I could rent a car for a couple days. That way I don't have to spend all that money every single year on insurance and making sure that it's up to spec. And nope, not dealing with that at all. Also, referring to the housing shortage as a problem of Soviet level imperial control. Come on, you don't want to be a Texan American stereotype of, I don't like this thing, it is communist. Come on, man, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> but asking why shouldn't the market uh, be able to decide what amenities a building includes? Because the market is dumb as f If we let the market decide what amenities a building includes, we would have Houston, Texas, which I guess I need to remind you, isn't a good idea because it's awful. The point is we can have all these individual developers and councils and boroughs all working to make sure their places are as good as possible. And then you still need to have city planners that are making sure that all of it gels well. Otherwise you're going to have just a really awful place like Houston, Texas. So I guess for a Houstonian like this, why Houston's urban planning is better than London's is you have more freedom to build whatever you want and not care about anyone else around you, not care that your house is going to be negatively impacting any of your neighbors, not care that the giant parking lot is next to other giant parking lots, which is next to other giant parking lots, and the city has become unnavigable by anyone unless they are a giant car. 
and uh, I've not yet transitioned to a car, so I can't tell you, but I've heard it's a honking good time. But yeah, point being, the whole point of having these regulations in place is to make sure that the place is nice to live in and there is someone making sure that the star piece goes into the star hole and we don't have a whole place full of a-holes. Now, uh, we did have a comment here coming up in reply saying, as a Houstonian, uh, you should probably be familiar with the concept of a man's only as good as his word. All right, whatever bollocks you just spouted about Soviet control, the fact remains the building company promised to abide by those rules and they fell drastically short. Also, mental note to all disabled people, don't go to Houston. Apparently, you being able to turn your wheelchairs or enter buildings reeks of commie and must be stopped. <laughs> I know that America does have the ADA, which is a policy to ensure that uh, disabled people do have access, but it does fall quite short, specifically in Houston, even New York. I did see a video of a man with cerebral palsy trying to get around New York, which is supposedly one of the best cities in the US for disabled access. And it's so tragic seeing him tr having to like go downstairs to access a lift. What's the point? But specifically in Houston, Texas, I found uh, this lovely intersection here. Question to viewers. If you are someone in a wheelchair, how the bloody living f are you meant to get around? There are poles all over the sidewalk. What do you mean? What is the point? This is why we have city planners so that we can understand, okay, the pavement needs to be for people with feet and also people with wheelchair. So therefore people with wheelchair don't have to go around anything. Don't just put poles everywhere because you're told, I'll just put a sign up. There are, there are laws for a reason. Also, I guess if you're a Houstonian watching this, you're probably like, Pfft like anyone would walk here. That's the point. It could be a nice place to walk, but you made it look awful so that no one would want to walk. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you guys are unaware, Houston also has one of the widest freeways in all of the world, in all the US at least. It's massive. Look at this boy. Look at, supposedly they're gonna put another couple lanes on there. Supposedly that's gonna solve the problem. <laughs> it's like they have just no idea what they're doing. I think the writing's on the wall, guys. The people in charge of urban planning in Houston aren't people. They are just cars. There's been more than enough research showing expanding lanes on a highway doesn't actually solve the traffic problem. It just delays it a little bit as more lanes means more cars can go on it, which means more cars do go on it, which means the problem is still there. As opposed to, I don't know, removing a few lanes and building a functional light rail system. Just thought. Now, the other day I was having a read on one of my favorite publications. You know me, I love reading Texas Monthly. For the Texas man in me, there's not a Texas man in me at the moment. Anyway, so I was reading Texas Monthly and I came across this interesting article in which they're trying to show Texan readers just how big Houston is, the scope. Houston is a really, really big city, but they're doing it in a way to kind of make their viewers, their readers feel like, oh God, Houston's big. Thank God I'm nowhere else that's super scale -y. Here we have a map of Houston overlaid on a map of London. Now. At first glance, I would say L London is a bit bigger. I mean, I, I would refer to Greater London as everywhere within that ring road. And even then I've got like a couple friends live out of the ring road and that's still considered London to some crazy folk because it's on the underground. Chesham, anyone? Is that zone nine? Either way, I digress. Now this article says, a journey that covers roughly the same distance as a trip from the airport to the intersection of the Beltway and I-69 in Houston would get a London commuter from the suburb of Watford to the suburb of Epsom. Now they've chosen these two very specifically to paint a negative picture, I'll, I'll explain later. We have, that trip would take two hours. It would require a 34 minute ride on an overland train. Who calls it an overland train? Who are you? Uh, to get to an underground train, which then the traveler would have to take to get another overland train where they'd spend 20 minutes before. Okay, and if you're a Texan, you might wanna skip this bit. It's very scary. A brisk seven minute walk. Oh God to a bus station, which would then finally drop them off at the destination. Now that sounds like some sort of dystopian hell. Am I right, Texans? You gotta take a train, to a train, to a, a walk, Ow! to a bus? Nah, not in Texas. I can drive right to the airport and pick myself up some Whataburger. Well, let's choose some further destinations on this very map, because they've specifically chosen Watford and Epsom as those specific parts are a little bit more difficult to get to. And they've been a bit disingenuous with that selection as well because I've actually been from Watford to Epsom. Fun fact, used to date a girl in Epsom and I actually took her to Harry Potter World at one point and that is in Watford. And I never once had to take the bus. We have enough trains. Sometimes, depending on where you're in Epsom, sure, you have to take a bus. But let's just say instead we go from Chessent 
all right, which is further than Houston. So, oh my gosh, further than this big city of Houston. Let's take it all the way to Croydon, all right, right there on the line. It takes one hour and one minute. That's, that's half of the time that supposedly this Houston, this Texan magazine is trying to scare their viewers into being like, oh God, London would take two hours on multiple trains and buses and walks. Nah, it takes about an hour. You basically take a national rail to the underground and then take another national rail to get your way to Croydon to then get your way to a hospital because you went to Croydon. But that was your decision. It, at least it's free healthcare there. You know, if, if you're gonna go to the hospital, at least it's free. But also maybe one thing they're not considering that brisk seven minute walk is actually gonna be really enjoyable. Luckily, we have some city planners, even out in old jolly Epsom, that are going to make it so that we have things like trees, not just parking lots and uh, fast food restaurants for cars to go to. And so you might find you walk a bit more when it's enjoyable to do so. It's interesting they incorrectly say overland train, but then correctly say underground train. Whereas I assumed as an American, they would say subway or subscribe to my YouTube channel. Oh, why not just say overground? Who says overland? Is that really something they say in Texas? It has offended me. That sounds like saying, I'll have some chips and fish, please. No. Now, for those of you that have been subscribed, to my YouTube channel for a long time now, you might know I used to do community videos a lot more regularly where I would read out some comments on videos that I felt like added value and were just really interesting. That's what this video was going to be, but I ended up just taking one comment of the many and I just wanted to make that its own video because I felt like this was such an interesting topic. So if you do like this type of thing, please tell me uh, or just subscribe so I actually know via numbers. Otherwise, I just wanted to give a quick shout out before you go to my favorite sponsor, Squarespace. I hope that doesn't make the other sponsors jealous, but if you're unaware, Squarespace is your all-in-one website builder. Do you wanna build a website, maybe have a blog, a web store, anything you want, you can build it on Squarespace. You can also get a domain of your choice. I actually got evanedinger.com, that's mine now. And I actually get to host my Squarespace website with that. How easy was it for me to design my Squarespace website? Oh my God, why would you ask that? It was so easy. There's all these templates available. I typed a little thing in, changed the code a bit and bam, now I've got a lovely functional website where I actually get some brand deals through from there. Even though I've got like my business email prominently and everything, people are like that Squarespace site, that looks so professional. I will message him on the Squarespace protocol about a possible brand deal. So actually, it's made me money as, as a YouTuber. So thanks, Squarespace. So if you'd like to take your online business into the professional sphere and build a website of your own, do it with Squarespace. Sign up to squarespace.com slash Evan Edinger or use code Evan Edinger at checkout. And you can get a 14 day free trial. Try it out. And when you figure out, I love this, you get 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace for sponsoring. And let's wrap this up. Now, obviously, absolutely no ill will towards Mr. Houstonian man. I do hope you genuinely get a chance to visit a city like London so you can understand why we have the planning permissions and regulations in place. Sure, they might be over the top in a lot of cases, but the overarching reason is a good one. It's so the city can be beautiful and loved by all of its inhabitants. Now, as soon as I'm done finishing this video, I'm gonna go finish up Hollow Knight. I don't know how I've slept on that game for so long. It is beautiful, such a beautiful game. So I'm gonna go play that. Otherwise, if you'd like, you can watch another one of my videos right here. My mom's in this one. It's actually pretty good. If you haven't seen it, I'd watch it. It's one of my best, actually. I took my mom around the UK and she had some interesting thoughts, being an American that has never left America before. So go watch that if you haven't seen it yet. Otherwise, I'll see you next Sunday. Goodbye.